You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your naturally platinum blonde pop culture connoisseur. I'm the reality TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and host with only the hottest tea spilled fresh weekly. For more hot takes, go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. I always keep it funny and I always keep it cute. And if you're like me and you want to stay up to date with the latest reality tea, you can always go and give us a follow at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram at no filter with Zach on the Instagram, or you can always join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. Wow, 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 wow. Do we have so much tea to break down today? Everybody get ready. So covering today, we will be talking about Erica Jane and um, some rumors that have been surfacing around the Beverly Hills reunion as well as some photos that were posted by the Daily Mail this week. We're also going to be talking about this big exclusive that Ronald Richards gave to Up and Adam this week. We will be discussing that as well. And my phone call with Ronald Richards, because after I did have some critiques in regards to what he had to say on Up and Adam, and I shared those remarks on Twitter, and I heard from him. And we had a very long 40-minute conversation. Um, He made a lot of uh, new claims that I thought were really interesting that will break down today on the show. And I've also heard from Erica's attorney as well, which I will break down for you on today's show as well. So today is going to be extra hot, extra juicy. So yes, you are getting this episode a little later than usual. I know typically on Fridays, I upload the Instagram live recording that we tape every Thursday evening. Unfortunately, there was an issue with the audio recording from last night's Instagram live. And, um, And there was an issue with the Instagram live feed from last night. So I'm having to re-record this on Friday morning. But that's okay because now you get a little bit more of a formal episode from me today on your Friday as you hopefully are listening to this sipping some tea. Maybe you're sipping some no filter rosé. I know I am. I love me some no filter rosé because I designed it for us to be able to enjoy over the summer. Now we're leaving summer and going into fall, but it is still a perfect beverage to be watching, especially with the Beverly Hills reunion coming up, and we have Salt Lake City and Potomac, and we can sip all of these while we're watching all of these shows. You can get it at nofilterwine.com, 14% alcohol by volume, but less than a gram of sugar. So you will be getting Liddy City, but you should not be hurting too much the next morning designed very consciously with you in mind. Please drink responsibly. I cannot say that enough because I want you to get Liddy City, but I want you to be smart about it as well. So head over to nofilterwine.com to stock up on your housewives-inspired rosé. Are we ready to dive into everything? So first, let's do a round of like some myth busting. So there have been some rumors that Erica and Andy had a big blowout at the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills reunion. I can confirm that that does not appear to be the case. They and Andy definitely, from what I've heard and from what I've been able to confirm, Andy does grill Erica. He does ask her a lot of the hard questions that we all that we have all been wondering while watching this season of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Is there a big blow up screaming match? No, as far as I'm concerned, they may have shared some words, but there has been no big screaming match that continues throughout the entire reunion. Also in the reunion, Kyle does confront, or sorry, Erica does confront Kyle and Dorit about the comments that they've made behind her back on the show. So that does get addressed. Sutton does um, address a lot of her concerns. It doesn't seem like there was much resolution or mending. I'm told that Sutton was not happy or is not happy with the current place that her relationship with Erica is at following the reunion. And I do know that there is a big blowout between Garcelle and Lisa Renna, and that's apparently going to be a heated moment. I, I believe it's in relation to like something Lisa or Garcelle heard that Lisa said that Lisa claims she didn't actually say or something of that nature. It was about, you know, something lost in translation that they beef over. Apparently, Garcelle heard from somebody that Lisa Rinna said something that Garcelle didn't like. And Lisa Rinna was very defensive of that. And then they kind of get into it. So that's what I know about the Beverly Hills reunion. Obviously, the finale is coming up this upcoming week, this upcoming Wednesday. Then we'll get the trailer for the reunion and it should be juicy. Also, Erica Jane was spotted by the Daily Mail, or there were photos published on the Daily Mail where Erica was spotted out in West Hollywood, seemingly apartment shopping. I've been able to confirm that Erica has not been apartment shopping. Michael uh, Colon, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name, Michael Colon. He is the property manager of the building Erica was standing out in front of. He claims that Erica was not looking for a new one-bedroom apartment in West Hollywood. She was merely just visiting a friend. So... 
the photos with lots of smoke and, and no real fire there, guys, unfortunately. She's not apartment shopping. She's staying put, and she was just visiting a friend. Okay, shall we get into the government case that Erica was involved in, Ronald Richards' major exclusive that he revealed on Up and Adam? I have since called him out. We had a very long 40-minute conversation, which I will recap for you guys as well. And we'll get into what Erica's lawyer is now responding um, in response to the claims that Richards has made. So as we know on Real Houses of Beverly Hills this season, there was a two truths and a lie game. And Erica revealed that she was part of a government case where she wore a wire. Well, I got the real scoop on that. And I do know that Ronald Richards had investigated or he looked into what that case actually was. He wanted to find out what case she was involved in. He ended up getting involved in the case himself. He claims that he provided information that discredited Erica's credibility, which resulted in the case being dismissed. He made a big stir on on Twitter the other night and said that he was going to big have this big exclusive that he was going to reveal. He ended up going on Up and Adam and revealing this information. The case that he was referring to, which he revealed on Up and Adam, was a fraudulent charge on Erica's credit card that was disputed. So he didn't give too many details about what the case actually was other than it being a credit card fraud case and saying that the case was dismissed and saying that he participated in the case by providing information about Erica Girardi. But he didn't give much more beyond that. So I did a little a little digging myself. And so, yes, it's true. He was involved in the case. Yes, the case was just recently dismissed. And yes, Erica was a witness in the case. She was a witness against the defendant. The, fend- the defendant is a merchant that was overcharging or allegedly overcharging Erica's credit card. I guess it wouldn't technically be allegedly because the, the money was revert or the Credit card ended up accepting it as a fraudulent charge and giving Erica her money back. Ron claims that it was his information that likely resulted in the case getting dismissed because he shot down her credibility and his actions helped. This is a direct quote from his Twitter. The defendant, it helped get the defendant out of harm's way. What does that actually mean? I mean, initially, I'm kind of like, well, the defendant is somebody that allegedly committed credit card fraud. I don't know how many people are actually out there accidentally committing credit card fraud. I don't know how many people are accidentally overcharging people's credit cards. Like to me, that doesn't just happen every day, you know? And it's just like, anyway, the charges were indeed fraudulent. And apparently Erica Girardi was not the only high profile client that was targeted and had to deal with this mess. She's just the one that happened to be one of the witnesses involved in this specific criminal case against this defendant, aka this merchant. I wasn't able to identify the merchant. I believe that that is under wraps. There are confidentiality issues involving the case, and apparently a lot of people are not allowed to talk about it, and they're not talking about it, so all we get is Ron's story and the sources that I was able to contact and dig up information on this case for. So Ronald did call me yesterday, And we spoke on the phone for a good 40 minutes. And in our conversation, he doubled down. He said cases get dismissed for a lack of evidence or a lack of witnesses, which he took credit for again, saying that he shot down Erica's credibility and one plus two must equal three. I was kind of like, well, but those could be two separate isolated incidents. You could have provided information that may or may not have gotten her credibility shot, but who knows why the case was dismissed. And he himself said, well, you're right. I can't read the prosecutor's mind. I don't know exactly why the case was dismissed. I was like, but then you went on up and at him and claimed that you were the reason the case was dismissed because you shot Erica's credibility. Doesn't sound like the two are adding up here. It sounds like one plus two equals eight. And I'm trying to get understand how you got to eight. You jumped a little ahead. So I was able to find out, though, that Erica was not the only witness in this case, which kind of shots shoots down Richard's claim that it was his shooting of her credibility that ended up getting the case dismissed. But there was more than one witness. I won't disclose how many witnesses, but there was more than one witness that was involved in this case. There were more than two witnesses. So it wasn't just like Erica and one other person. Like There were other witnesses that could have corroborated um, Erica's uh, account of what happened with the credit card. There were other witnesses. Like I said, there were other high profile victims that were also targeted or involved in this as well. So again, if there's a merchant and there are a few different people out there, I'm not outing the merchant, but if there is a merchant and they're 
overcharging other people's credit cards. I mean, come on. Are they really that innocent? Mm. So Ron said that there was a government case where Erica was a witness and the charges got dismissed because I believe, this is his direct quote, I believe she has credibility problems and I believe they read my materials that were provided. That's what he said. Sounds like he wasn't the reason that the case was actually dismissed, but I know he does love to take his credit. He possibly got one of the witnesses booted being Erica Girardi, but that's hardly enough to take credit for the entire case being dismissed. The story itself, I know, isn't that juicy. We'll get into the more juicy stuff. I just wanted to kind of clarify all of the details there um, because I know a lot of people had questions about the case and they were really confused as to what it was. It was a merchant overcharging credit cards and... Um, for whatever reason, we don't know why the case was actually dismissed. Maybe now that it's dismissed, more people will be allowed to talk about it. I don't know. But here's what is juicy. It's everything else that we discussed. So I want to clarify that Ronald Richards did call me. I did not reach out to him. I didn't ask him for comment. He called me and not once in our conversation did he disclose that our conversation was off the record. So let's get into the claims that he actually made. So he revealed that Erica is currently in negotiations to settle for to settle on the alleged $25 million that Ron and the the bankruptcy trustee claim that Erica owes. So Ron says that he's been in negotiations with Erica's attorney, Evan C. Borges, and he claims they want to settle. Those were his direct words, that they want to settle, that they weren't looking to pay the full $25 million, that, but that they were interested in settling for a lower amount of what Erica allegedly owes. Here's what Ron had to say. She's liable for that money. There's no dispute from her legal team. There is no dispute from her legal team that she has to give back some of the money. If she went to trial, they would fine for us $25 million because she paid no consideration for that money. When I talked to her lawyer, he's referring to Evan C. Borges. When I talked to her lawyer, who I talk to all the time, there's no dispute that Erica has knowledge of the expenses being paid and being deducted. What he says in the media, referring to comments that Evan has made to the press or in response to some of the claims Ronald Richards has previously made, what he says in the media protecting his client is different than what he tells me on the phone. We're talking apples and oranges. I mean, he has a job to do. He also confirmed that there is no, Ron confirmed that there has been no forensic accounting done to the Girardi Keys books and that Erica does not have any of the paperwork related to any of the charges on the Amex bill or any of those expenses. Those he claims were all, which is kind of what I assumed. And I know like Emily D. Baker is almost also on her lives. I've listened to her and she's also kind of come to this conclusion as well that if Girardi Keese was the one paying for these bills or Tom was paying for them on, and using Girardi Keese money on behalf of Erica, then doesn't that mean Girardi Keese or Tom would, be, would have been the person that's in possession of those bills and those expenses? And this seems to corroborate that as Ron is, is claiming that Erica doesn't have any of the paperwork, that it doesn't have any of the expenses or the bills, that those were all in possession of Girardi Keese and now currently in possession of the bankruptcy trustee. He claims that his involvement in the Girardi Keese bankruptcy has now ended and his job is done. Um, because I did tweet about in response to the Up and Adam interview, I tweeted and I said that this is not that the credit card fraud case has no relation to the bankruptcy embezzlement scandal. And I think that Ron should focus on doing his job and involving himself in another criminal case that has nothing to do with this. Sounds like he has a personal vendetta or personal bias against Erica. And I would I want him to focus on doing his job. And these are all things I said to him. Like I said, we had a 40 minute conversation. We exchanged some words. We did come to some common ground by the end of it. Um, and he did ask me to have him back on my show, which I said I would think about. And I'm ultimately asking you guys leave a comment, uh, send me a DM. Let me know if you think I should have a sit down one on one with him and answer a lot of these things, um, because we did have a very good conversation that I wish we could have recorded and released on the podcast. Um, but obviously we didn't and we can't, but it doesn't mean it's not something we can't do in the future. But so in response to me saying, do your job on Twitter, he said, when you say do my job, my job is over. I'm just waiting to come up with the settlement. She's not going to make me hammer her at trial or file a summary judgment motion. It's silly. At 25 million, I stop because she can't pay me 25 million. We should settle for 10 or 20 cents on the dollar. She's not going to pay me $25 million. She doesn't have it. She spent it. So it seems like here he's acknowledging that um, she let her best bet is to settle at this point. Um, Ron continued by saying Erica's legal team wants to settle after she resolves her tax issues. They need a global settlement. I mean, she can't just settle with me. And then the IRS comes in and then the the franchise tax board. So 
he seems to be under the impression or was given the impression that Erica's legal team does want to settle for a lower amount aside from the 25 million. Again, I was surprised by this information because a forensic accounting I thought would have needed to have been done with the Girardi Keys books to find out which of that money was um, entitled to Girardi Keys, which of that money was client money that would, didn't get paid. I would assume at some point a fraction of the it, of the the settlement money that was received, some of it would have likely gone towards like a salary or something equivalent to a salary of what Tom Girardi should have been receiving. Ron claims that Tom never took a salary. Um, so again, we would need a whole forensic accounting into the books to find out where's the what where the money went, who the money originally belonged to, and what Erica may or may not have to pay back. Again, this is over the course of a 12-year time span, so obviously statute of limitation issues I would imagine would also come to light. Ron clarified that he, he said, I'm trying to help give her the tools to settle this and move on with her life. I have nothing against Erica, but... Uh, but by the way, if I did, I'm entitled to, I'm not a prosecutor. I'm a private attorney. I can have a bias all day long, but in this case, I don't. So he says he has no personal agenda against Erica. He has no bias against Erica. He made that very clear that he doesn't have anything against her personally. Um, I don't know if I fully agree with that based off of, you know, him now involving himself in this other criminal case that has nothing to do with the bankruptcy. It seems like there does appear to be some bias. And I told him that directly on the phone. This is not new information to him. I said that to him, you know, when I spoke with him. But Ron clarified, at this point, I've done my job. I am not going to work anymore. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. I don't need to prove anything to you. I have every number. If you want to look at every book, every penny to the $25 million went to her. So he's claiming he has all the receipts and can prove that the money went to her and that she owes the money and that she is liable. So I did reach out to Evan C. Borges, who is Erica's attorney, and asked for a response to these claims about a settlement, to the claims that she is, um, or to the claims that they acknowledge that she will have to pay something. Um, Ron also did claim, and we'll get into Evan's statement shortly, but Ron also did claim that there is a benefactor that is paying Erica's bills. As you know, there are rumors surfacing that she has a sugar daddy. I know some people th believe that it might be the owner of the South Point Casino and Hotel out in Las Vegas, also the owner of Michael's Gourmet Room. Michael is the one that they think might be her sugar daddy. He was friendly with Tom Girardi and Erica for many years. Erica has many times said that Michael's Gourmet Room is one of her favorite date night spots. She talked about it in her book. She also talked about it in a People Magazine interview that she gave back in 2017. So people are are drawing conclusions and thinking that he may be this benefactor that Ron is referring to that's paying for her bills, be it personal or legal. Um, Ron said, who's paying her legal bills? What if the what if that accounts where she moved victim money into? She needs to disclose it so that we don't think it's assets of the estate. So I asked Evan C. Borges about that as well, about this potential benefactor and what he had to respond to any of that. And this is what Evan C. Borges has had to say about this entire, about all the claims that Ronald Richards made. So Evan says, I can't say enough that based on the evidence and law, Erica does not have liability for any of the claims against her. All the claims against Erica amount to efforts to blame her for the actions of others, including Girardi Keese and Tom Girardi. Erica never received a penny of the $25 million that the trustee says Girardi Keese paid to vendors and creditors of EJ Global LLC over a 12-year period between 2008 and 2020, nor did EJ Global LLC receive the money, even according to the trustee's contentions. If the law matters, Erica does not have personal responsibility personal liability for any of those transactions. Mitch Mr. Richards is incorrect in saying that I agree with his positions. Yes, he has told me that the trustee wants to settle, but that settlement to me by him is supposed to be conf a confidential settlement communication. He told you about it, which is improper, but because he said something to you, I'm responding. Mr. Richards can't read my mind, which he makes long when he makes long statements to me and I respond with, I understand. It means I understand. Not that I agree. The fact of the matter is that when I have private discuss discussions with Mr. Richards, he seems pragmatic and I have no personal animus against him. Nonetheless, your email is another example of him turning around and making public statements that one, don't advance anyone's agenda except publicity for him, and two, make it more difficult for me to discuss the case with him in the future. 
Here's the reality. My client depends on her housewife's income to get by. There is no hidden treasure of assets and everyone keeps piling on and trashing her for things she didn't do. Keep in mind, Tom Girardi was a very powerful and wealthy attorney during his marriage to Erica. Erica has a 12th grade education and was never involved in the management of the firm. Whatever happened with the firm and Tom Girardi is for them to answer. That is the full quote that, that, or that is the full statement that Evan gave me. Like I said, there were the, um, there was the benefactor issue that came up and Ron claimed, or I mean, there was a conversation about it being possibly a sugar daddy. And, you know, Ron said that, well, if it is a sugar daddy, then she should clarify that, that it's a sugar daddy or the sugar, sugar daddy t- should take ownership for paying for her bills. This is what uh, Evan's response to the benefactor claims paying her bills and what Ron Richards was claiming. Zach, the short answer is that there is no way to under, there is no way under the sun any third party is secretly funneling to Erica assets of Girardi Keys or Tom Girardi. She has been and is trying to make it on her own, which we can and will prove with bank records and testimony under penalty of perjury, assuming hypothetically that she has people in her life who care about her and help with her legal expenses. It is a private matter. I kind of agree with that. I was like, and that was kind of the point that I made with Ron. I was like, well, even if she does have a sugar daddy, like she's entitled, like if somebody wants to come forward and pay her bills, like that's their business. They don't have to disclose any of where their assets are coming from or disclose that they're even paying her bills necessarily. So I understand where Ron is coming from. Um, it sounds like, I mean, he was very clear that his his job at this point is done. So I should, you know, back off on telling him to do his job. So I guess at this point, I mean, what he, I don't know if that isn't necessarily clear if that means he's been released from the, by the bankruptcy trustee. It sounds like there are still some settlement negotiations or settlement conversations. It doesn't even seem like there's necessarily negotiations happening, but there are conversations that are being had in related in relation to possible settlements that Erica could possibly pay in the future. Evan seems to be very adamant that she is not liable for any of those expenses and that the focus should be turned back on Girardi Keys and on Tom Girardi. I echo that sentiment. I've been very clear that I think Tom Girardi is the person that should be in question here. Obviously, he is claiming to have Alzheimer's and dementia and he is now in an assisted living facility. It's very hard to get hit. He's already said that he's not going to be or his conservator has said that he will not be answering any questions. If he is called in, he'll be pleading the fifth because he is not of sound mind to be able to answer any of these questions. So my thing is like, okay, well, if Tom Girardi's not doing it, then why aren't we going after the son-in-law? Why aren't we asking his daughter? I mean, his daughter's married to his son-in-law. They were receiving benefits from Girardi Keys as well. They heavily benefited from the law firm. I think they should absolutely be investigated a little bit more. They should absolutely be talked about in the press a lot more. You know, this is a highly publicized case. There are many other lawyers that had a fiduciary responsibility to the clients of Girardi Keys that I think are the ones that should be grilled right now. That's not to say that Erica didn't benefit from this lifestyle. That's not to say that Erica's entirely innocent. Um, but In terms of her having to pay back the money, I mean, obviously the IRS is going to get involved and that's where things are really going to get messy. Obviously in the tax returns, Erica did sign the tax returns um, or sign her tax returns. And we now know that in the Girardi Keys tax returns that Tom was writing off these expenses that he was paying on behalf of Erica as loans to EJ Global. That seems to be fraudulent. I believe that's why they're being referred to as fraudulent, um, fraudulent transfers because it wasn't an actual like cash transfer. It wasn't an actual loan that was given out. And it doesn't seem like there was any intention to have any of that money paid back. There was no contract that um, usually when you take out a loan or when someone gives you a loan, there is some sort of written contract that both parties have to sign with the acknowledgement of I'm giving you this money to be paid back by this time. And you're going to pay this much interest. If any, you know, there are all of those things. Like think of it as like when you take a loan out with a bank, you know, you typically have to put up collateral or you have to, you know, there's a whole process which you have to go through in order for a loan to be made. Um, None of that paperwork currently exists. So I can understand how Erica's legal team might be like, well, there's no actual written contract or proof that this was an actual loan. I imagine that'll probably be an argument that'll be used in the future. It's a very, very messy situation. Obviously, you know, it looks like in terms of Ron's uh, participation in the investigation, 
He seems to be kind of bowing out and just hoping for a settlement at this point. I don't know if there's anything more he can or has to prove or if Erica's legal team will even go to trial with any of this, you know, that. But again, there are so many other people that we should be focusing on. There are so many other unresolved cases at Girardi Keys that could bring money into the law firm that could actually pay the victims back their money. That's not to say that I like that Erica benefit, her lifestyle was benefited off of potentially stolen client money. Again, there needs to be a forensic accounting that goes into the Girardi Keys books that determines which of the money that went to pay for Erica's lifestyle was client money, which of that money was a possible potential salary for Tom Girardi, which of that money was in, in it was entitled to Girardi Keys as part of their 40% commission from those settlements. You know, we have to really separate fact from fiction and do some myth busting. I know it's not the narrative that everybody loves. I know it's not the narrative that the media loves to run, but that's the reality of the situation. And again, I like to reiterate, like Tom Girardi, Girardi Keys, the other lawyers, what we have... Um, uh, Keith, we have we have David, David Lira, we have Jacqueline, Tom's daughter, all these other people that could potentially be involved. And if it's like if you're going to go after Erica for benefiting off of this lifestyle, then why aren't you going after Trisha A. Bigelow? I want to see how Tom wrote off buying or allegedly buying Trisha A. Bigelow's new butt. Just as Trisha A. Bigelow benefited from Tom Girardi's money. Was that Tom Girardi's money? Was that Girardi Keys money? Was that client settlement money? I think she should be investigated as well. And she should possibly have to pay back that, you know, plastic surgery that Tom allegedly paid for for her. Because I would imagine that if you look at the books, he probably wrote those off as loans as well. Or he wrote those off in some type of way. Um, let's talk about Amber, Amber, the real estate agent that he's been parading around town and taking to all of these events. I'm pretty sure there were some benefits to Amber as well. She definitely benefited off of that lifestyle. Why aren't we pulling her into question? It's not to say that Erica shouldn't have to answer for certain things. Um, should she have to answer for everything her husband did? No, her husband did it. Tom Girardi is the guilty party here. So, I mean, there are a lot of people that we can get money from outside of Erica that we can use to pay back the victims. Erica is not the sole person on the line for all of this. There were a lot of people that benefited from Tom Girardi's shady business dealings. And that's where I think the attention and focus should be. Um, I did talk about this on the Instagram Live last night, so I will recap it here as well. Portia Williams has announced her exit. Portia for real has announced her exit from Real Housewives of Atlanta. She says that she will not be returning. A lot of people are speculating that because she, well, obviously we know Cynthia Bailey announced her exit earlier this week. Now Portia has announced her exit. There have been rumors flying around that both of them would not be returning. I assumed when those rumors first floated around that uh, Cynthia was going to be fired and that Portia was probably holding out from signing her contract because she knew that her relationship with Simon and her potentially stealing Simon from Fallon was uh, going to be the centerfold of this new season of Real Housewives of Atlanta. And because she knew that she was going to be a main focus, she wanted more money and she was holding out. We now know that she that that does not appear to be the case because she is not going to be coming back for this new season. Some people are saying that she is getting a spinoff and that's probably why she's going to go off on her own and pull a Bethany and, and fly off into the sunset on her own. Um, I want to remind everybody that it is a special, not necessarily a full on spinoff series. It is a four part special or it's supposed to be a four part special that should be airing later this fall. I don't know if they've actually started filming. I believe that they have started filming it. So we should see that at some point in the future. She obviously still has chat room. If I could make any sort of guess, I would assume she was holding out for more money. And then Bravo got to the point where they're like, we're not going to pay you X amount of dollars. You already have a spinoff show. You already have Bravo chat room. You're already making, you know, additional money off of us. We're not going to pay you this much higher salary. This is the number we will give you. She was probably willing to walk. Andy Cohen has since come out and said that this is just a pause, very similar to the pause that they put Dorinda on. I don't know if I fully believe that. I believe that this was likely a fallout from contract negotiations and her wanting a higher salary. We do know that the women on Real Houses of Atlanta are some of the highest paid in the entire franchise because they have brought in some of the highest ratings. So they are making a lot of money. Like their their salaries are in the millions. I believe like one to two million. It's definitely over a million. I want to say that I've heard that like Candy's salary is around two million, but they make good money. 
Um, we will be missing Portia. I think that Portia brought a lot to the show. I think I would have loved to have seen Kenya go at her this season in regards to the Fallon and Simon stuff. Obviously, it sounds like she may have also ran because she didn't want to address the Simon and Fallon stuff. It could have not been a contract dispute, but really just like, a, I don't want that to be the focus of my storyline. And they're like, well, if you don't want to talk about that, then we don't need to bring you back next season. Who knows? But Andy says that it is a pause. Portia, Portia says, I'm out for real. So we'll see. We shall see. Great episodes of Salt Lake City. Great episodes of Potomac this week. Thoroughly enjoyed both of them. Um, Mary is, ugh, she makes me cringe, but she's kind of winning my heart over a little bit. And I hate to say that. Salt Lake City, loving Meredith and this mama bear energy. I think Jen needs to own it and be honest. I think Jenny is really bringing the heat and she is feisty. I did like on Beverly Hills seeing Sutton and uh, Erica sort of mend fences a little bit. It was a little disheartening to see them both in their confessionals be like, yeah, I'm not ready to move on. I'm not forgiving her. It was a little interesting that Erica's like, I, you know, seemingly was it her when you heard the apology, it seemed genuine. And then you see in the in her confessional, she's like, well, it wasn't genuine. I was just trying to smooth things over for that. So that's easier for everybody else. But in relation to Sutton, I was a little disappointed to see Erica apologize and be like, look, I snapped. I'm under a lot of pressure. I'm sorry that I yelled at you. And then Sutton was like, no, you don't need to apologize to me. And then in the confessional, she's like, I don't believe her apology. And I'm like. Again, big and bad and brave behind Erica's back. But yet when you're to her face, you seem a little afraid. To be fair, Erica has threatened to sue her or has, yeah, she has threatened to, she said, I'm coming for you. So she has threatened Sutton. So I understand Sutton's hesitancy. And Sutton even said that when Kyle called her out and she's like, Sutton, cat got your tongue. And Sutton's like, y'all saw her threaten me. And now you want me to still be big and bad and brave to her. But Sutton is very brave in her confessionals. And I have to say, like, I'm loving all of them this season. I really am. I did kind of love Garcelle's shady moment where she's like, have any of us, never have I ever stolen anything. And Erica's like, I don't like that shit. You tell me or you don't tell me, but I don't like these games, which I thought was kind of funny. Like, listen, I don't have any, I don't dislike anybody on the cast this season. I think they're all great. I think they're all bringing it. And I hope that they all come back. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would imagine they all would come back. I would imagine it would be like Jersey, like when the, the, the season is good and the cast is right. Why change it? Obviously, Jersey is getting a little stale with the exact same cast. So they are starting to mix things up into this new season. So I wouldn't hate to see them. I mean, I wouldn't hate to see someone like a new friend. Up. Well, I mean, part of me says I wouldn't hate to see a new friend of join the mix. But then at the same time, I'm also like, but then is that too many women or bringing too many people in? Do we have to reduce somebody else's role? And if we could reduce somebody else's role, who would it be? Would it be maybe Dorit would get a reduced role? I want to see Crystal come back at a full time capacity. I love Crystal. I like Sutton. Love Garcelle. Um, I like Rena. I like Dorit. I like Kyle. I like all of them. And I can't wait to see what the reunion has in store for all of us. All right, guys, that's all I got for you. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday or happy whatever day you're listening to this. I hope you are getting Liddy City and drinking some of my no filter rosé. It is Housewives inspired rosé. I'm calling it my Housewives watching wine so that we can watch Housewives and sip some rosé together. Like I said, it's 14% alcohol by volume, but less than a gram of sugar. You can order it now at nofilterwine.com. We have book club happening every Tuesday on Instagram Live and uploaded to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash JustPlainZach, where we are recapping and breaking down Erica Jane's book, Pretty Mess. We break, the, we break down three chapters every week. We did chapters one, two, and three four, five, and six. And then this week we did seven, eight, and nine. Next week we'll be doing 10, 11, and 12. And then the final week we'll cover the last three chapters and then we'll move on to our next book and book club. So we go live every Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 Eastern. We go live every Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 Eastern as we do Thirsty Thursday tea time. Thirsty Thursday live recaps. So you can join us live at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram. You can follow me personally at Just Plain Zach because I post really fun and funny stuff there as well. And please leave me a five-star review if you're loving the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell notification button. That way the T is always in your notifications. All right, guys. Love you. Mean it. Bye. <laughs>